Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, a preview of the East Hampton Film Festival, which kicks off this Friday with festival organizer Chris Ferry and filmmakers Wally marzano Lesnovich and Melissa Dimitris. And a recap of Hampshire Pride with Northampton Mayor Gina Louise Shera, Chief Jody Casper, and Councilors Marissa Elkins and Garrick Perry. But first, the doom. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Some more kitchen table astronomy with Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid. Mr. Universe, there are things that we don't know about our future. But one thing that we do know, thanks to science and astronomy, is that eventually the sun is going to eat our planet. And, at least recently observed, another sun has eaten another planet. Right. Well, I thought you were going to say, you know, the certainty of death and taxes oh, well, or that, something like that. We know right? that too. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Although I, I should say our planet is most likely going to be eaten by the sun. There is still a little bit of uncertainty. Not that it matters because life would no longer have been possible on our planet for a long time before that. But still, that's an interesting question. Well, Mercury and Venus certainly are going to be eaten by the sun about 5 billion years from now when it expands and it expands into red giant phase. Then uh, what happens is that once you run out of fuel, like now, right now, right at the center, you have hydrogen turning into helium and that is what is providing the energy source. Mm -hmm. But eventually you're gonna run out of hydrogen to fuse into helium at the core. So basically you have less energy in the center and the core will shrink because at that time, you won't be able to fuse helium into anything else. But if it shrinks, it gets hot. And if it gets hot, then you eventually get to about 100 million degrees at the center and you can start fusing helium into carbon. And so you have sort of like new energy source in the middle, which is much hotter. And that leads to sort of like a bloating or the expansion of the outer atmosphere. And as it expands, it gets sort of farther away from the central heat source, it appears a little bit redder, which is a little bit cooler than our surface temperature right now. So when you look at the sun right now, it's around 5,000 degrees, roughly around 5,000 Kelvin. Then it's going to be around 3,000, 3,500 degrees Kelvin. And it'll get bigger and bigger. It'll take over Mercury and Venus and maybe Earth. Maybe Earth and Mars as well. And as it happens, the outer planets, Jupiter and Saturn, which are very cold right now, they may be actually in a cool place, maybe even in a habitable zone. Wow. And we talk about, for example, the moons of Jupiter and Saturn, which have oceans. We have recently talked about that as well. So maybe, you know, the conditions may get better. For example, Saturn's moon Titan. There are some science fiction stories about that, that eventually in five billion years, that's a nicer place, except remember, that phase is not going to last very long and the sun is still going to be quite unstable and eventually it's going to turn into the core that will be left, which is the size of the earth and it is called a white dwarf. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like a very high density. It's a density of an atom. And the outer envelope of the gases will be left out. First, it's going to be this beautiful object called what astronomers call a planetary nebula, where you have this core in the middle surrounded by these beautiful glowing gases. And then we have lots of examples of those. So we know stars like our sun go through that phase and eventually those gases are going to dissipate and you are just going to be left with this core, which is the size of the earth. Basically you take the sun and put it down sort of like, you know, size of the earth, condense it into it, very high density. And that's what's called a white dwarf. Initially it's going to be very hot because the core is hot and then it's just going to cool down, cool down, cool down, cool down forever. Sorry to be a little down today, but you know, but that's, <laughs> that's what's going to be. And so as you started this conversation about it's going to eat up Mercury and Venus as it expands, do we have any examples of that? And just recently, uh, a new paper have come out in the journal Nature in which they have actually seen, oh well, seen meaning to say they can infer from what has happened that a star like our sun has eaten a planet. And did it use the same process? It ran out of fuel, it became Wookie. <laughs> That's Wookie the dog under the kitchen table at Kitchen Table Astronomy. <laughs> Wookie does not like the idea that this star has run out of fuel, but is that what happened? It was no longer able to convert hydrogen into helium, run, runs out of gas, literally, 
and then starts to expand? That's exactly right. So this particular star is about 10 billion years old. Uh, it's a star like our sun, so it has gone through that phase. And there were some astronomers who were looking for something else, uh, which I just find it really cool. They were actually looking for colliding stars, emerging stars, which are called red nova. Again, that's a separate conversation, but that's what they were looking for. And in their data, they found this anomaly, this, this a little bit, sort of like a you know, brightening of a star, which was a little unexpected. Usually with this colliding stars or merging stars, you find these to be much brighter. But here was a case where there was a little bit of brightness and they were like, huh, well, what is going on over there? And then they went back and looked at the older data. They took some new observations. And what they found was that here is a case where a planet, probably the size of Jupiter or a little bit bigger than that, so a gaseous giant, uh, and that had been eaten up, swallowed by this star whose envelope had expanded. So this was an expanded say, red giant, and this planet was close enough. And what is really cool is that they can actually look at the data. And what they found was that the planet was already interacting with the envelope of the star. And so there was this interaction going on. And eventually this brightening was when this planet exactly got actually absorbed by that star. It's like when you're toasting a marshmallow. Your marshmallow <coughs> interacts with the fire if you get a golden brown, but if it gets really hot, it, huge conflagration, your marshmallow's on fire now. That's right. So, so and, and, and remember, this is one of those cases where you know that marshmallows get sort of like, you know, <laughs> burnt. <laughs> but can you find that instant? So, th so the reason why we knew about it was because astronomers had seen some other red giant stars, where if you look at the envelope, like, you know, in the gaseous, if you look at the composition of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the gaseous envelope, you can actually see materials that are usually present in planets. So we knew, aha, we know this happens. And then astronomers also knew that many of those planets that have been discovered with all these exoplanets, more than 5,000 have been discovered. Some of them are very close, orbiting very close to their stars. So we know, okay, that means that they are going to get swallowed, but this is the first instance where they actually found it in the act of being swallowed. And that's actually, uh, I, I think, uh, really cool because I, I, what astronomers call, this is sort of like the missing link, meaning to say, okay, they knew that it had happened. They had seen sort of like, you know, planets very close to their star. And this is the case where they caught one right at the time happening. How long was the um, toasted marshmallow in conflagration marshmallow in our planetary marshmallow analogy in that conflagration state? Well, they found that that burst when it actually happened, it lasted about 10 days. Wow. So the marshmallow was nicely done by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> this is amazing too because, and you mentioned this, that we know about 5,000 exoplanets outside of our solar system. We theorized for a long time that these planets existed. We know there are billions and maybe trillions of galaxies, but we couldn't really prove it until when? Well, that was in the 1990s. So no. very recently until we just, we could say, aha, yes, now we have actual evidence. We knew we had a theory, but now we have evidence. And this is one of those cases that up until 1990s, we only had one example of a solar system. Right, so we know that, okay, well, this is how planets form. And so our theories were also based upon the idea that the way we had theorized how Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and so on and so forth, they form, all of our theories were based upon that. But then we started to find very different kinds of solar systems. And you go like, whoa, wait a minute. So there are other ways that star systems also find. And so once you get to these numbers, like 5,000 or so, you can really start doing science with those, meaning to say you can actually start creating pictures as well of how these different types of systems may have formed and how they evolve. And this particular case, what's relevant to us, because Monty, it's all about us. Yes. <laughs> that is the, it's a system like ours. And so in this case, it gives us a glimpse into our own future even though we will be long dead. I mean, and by we, I just don't mean me and you, Monty, but we, I mean everybody here because life would not be possible even a few billion years from now uh, because of changes in the sun and it's getting hotter and so on and so forth. So it's not about that, but you can imagine if there are advanced civilizations out there. I mean, this happens in 
every star system like the sun-like system, this is going to happen over there. And we know that every star system has planets. And we know some planets are close to the star. So this is a story in some sense that is happening countless times in the universe. And maybe there are some uh, civilizations out there or advanced beings. And they also calculate, for example, that the sun is their star is going to expand <laughs> and sheesh, we better do something. And then they have their political differences and they say, oh, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Climate change doesn't happen. A sun change doesn't happen. So uh, and so, um, we don't hear from them anymore. <laughs> Thanks to Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid for confirming all of my childhood fears. Hampshire Pride was back this Saturday in Northampton, and Monty was there. Coming up, a recap of Hampshire Pride with Northampton Mayor Gina Louise Shera, Chief Jody Casper, and Councilors Marissa Elkins and Garrick Perry. You're listening to the Fabulous Four One Three on NEPM. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. This past Saturday, 15,000 plus people lined the streets of downtown Northampton for the return of Pride, and Monty was there talking to him. At the return of Hampshire Pride for the first time since 2019, Pride is happening in downtown Northampton. And joining me for what it does not count as your Meet the Mayor segment, where we have a long sit down conversation about lots of different things, is the mayor of Northampton, Gina Louise Shera. What is this? return of this event mean for the city as the mayor and then for you as a human being? Hey Monty, it's so good to be here with you at Pride. Um, so, I mean, obviously Pride is so important in Northampton, so imp important to our identity. Um, it's just important to downtown, so it feels remarkable to have it be back. It feels remarkable to be standing here right now in downtown, which is where it, the, uh, the parade ended this year. Um, be surrounded by people who are happy and joyous and celebrating but also the other part of Pride is that some it's a protest in many ways. And there, this is a, it's definitely a moment in time where we have to stand up and protect people's rights, which are under extreme attack all across this country right now. Clay Pearson, who's one of the organizers, was on our show last week and said, wait till you hear the mayor's proclamation. So you haven't, pro you haven't proclaimed it yet, have you? I have not proclaimed it, but I'm going to bring it. How many times does it say whereas in it? Uh, I think we got six or seven. I added a few more at the last minute. It might be up to eight. <laughs> what about you as a person? Like, you uh, you know, you were a counselor before, but, you you know, I've known you for a long, long time before you were mayor. What does this return mean as an event for you as a and your family, I guess? So it's one of my very favorite events of the year. Um, before I was an elected official, I loved to be here and to watch the parade. Then when I became a counselor, I always participated in the parade, and it was really quite emotional to um, to lead the parade this year as mayor for the first time since it wasn't here you know we we didn't have it last year so I had a lot of feels about being there at the front and um, and just seeing people out here so excited and the energy and the love yeah it felt great well thanks for doing it and we're gonna book you soon for an official meet the mayor segment you got it okay so we have a special proclamation and so I'm gonna invite our mayor of Northampton Gina Louise to the stage that's Clay Pearson, who we had on the show last week, introducing the mayor. Thank you, Clay! Hello! Happy Pride! <laughs> Do you like my fascinator? Yeah. yeah, you like it? It's fascinating! I'm glad, because this is my kind of coronation, people! Yes! <laughs> All right, I am here to read a proclamation from the city. Whereas in 1981, conservative members of Congress introduced proposed legislation called the Family Protection Act to roll back the social progress made by the civil rights, feminist, and LGBTQIA plus movements. This legislation specifically targeted the rights of gay and lesbian people. And whereas in April 1982, a group of dedicated and concerned residents organized gala, gay and lesbian activists, and called for a march in downtown Northampton in opposition to the so-called Family Protection Act to be held on Saturday, May 15, 1982. And whereas that first Northampton Pride March had just a few hundred marchers, with some of them wearing bags over their heads to hide their identities from their employers out of fear of losing their jobs or their housing. And whereas the Northampton Pride March continued annually, and in 2019, the last Pride Parade before the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, Northampton hosted over 40,000 participants. The celebration
celebrations honor the diversity and contributions that our LGBTQIA plus friends and neighbors have made to our community, as well as recognizing the hard-won victories like protections from discrimination in the workplace and housing, as well as equal marriage. And whereas pride celebrations are an important time for celebration as well as continued vigilance and activism, especially since our LGBTQIA plus community members face increased discrimination, violence, and political efforts to roll back those hard fought rights. And whereas in the first four months of 2023 alone, over 470 anti-LGBTQIA plus bills have been introduced in the state legislature, more than twice as many in all of the last year. And Republican presidential candidates are making attacks on transgender youth and the LGBTQIA plus community central parts of their political platforms using hateful and dehumanizing rhetoric. That's right. Yep. And whereas, as we come together and celebrate today, we also stand firmly rooted in solidarity and unwavering commitment to fight for and protect each other's rights, arts, expression, health, well-being, and our hearts. And so now, therefore, I, Mayor Gina Louise Shera, do hereby proclaim May 6, 2023, as Hampshire Pride Day, and welcome this latest incarnation of LGBTQIA plus Pride in Northampton, as well as all who honor and rights of our LGBTQIA friends and neighbors and witness whereof I have set my hand in front of the seal of the city of Northampton on this day, this beautiful day, the sixth day of May, 2023. Yeah. I want you seven all to join me. Let's a violate open meeting law and have a, a counselors <laughs> talk about um, what's going on with Northampton Pride or the return of Hampshire Pride with Counselor at Large Marissa Elkins and Force Garrick Perry, who sometimes I forget his real name when I'm trying to refer to him as a counselor and not in his musical uh, moniker. What does the return of Pride here in downtown Northampton mean to you, Counselor Elkins? Oh, it's everything. It's so I, Pride is my favorite day of the year every year in Northampton. I've missed it. We've missed it all so terribly for the last four years, so we're delighted to have it back. And I'm so grateful for the folks who stepped up and, and pulled this off and got us back on the road uh, because it's just not Northampton without this event. So very excited. Your thoughts, Councillor Force Perry? Yeah, I, I just have to echo uh, Councillor Elkins' thoughts, is that for me, this is just such a joyous day and occasion. It reminds me of all the things that I love about Northampton, community, people, uh, you know, just seeing the vibrancy that's happening. And again, I, I want to salute everyone who was involved in not only organizing this, but also the city for really stepping up and helping to make this go through. And in a, a little bit of a shorter time frame than they usually planned it. It was a... It was a little compressed. There's yeah. a little bit of a compressed timeline, but they, uh, we had a nice crowd. It was a, a, a good contingency marching and lots of people on the, on the streets, and it was great. Yeah. We had on somebody who was at the first Pride back in 1982 on the show or, uh, last week, and we referenced many times the now esteemed radio host, but formerly famous for his role in the ACLU, and one of my best friends ever, Bill Newman. Bill Newman, what does Pride mean to you as you've seen it transition from literally having to sue the city of Northampton uh, with the what was called what the ACLU was called at the time um, to where it stands right now? Yeah, Arch Batista was the lawyer on that case. It came out of the Boston office. It was a couple of years before we opened the Western Massachusetts office, and I was hired as the legal director for the ACLU of Western Massachusetts, our Western office. And it has changed. That, those stories, I was there in those first parades where mostly women wore bags over their heads so they couldn't be identified because they were afraid they'd be ostracized for their families and some gay men as well, but really mostly afraid they were going to lose their job because people, you were marching in the parade, you must therefore be gay. And there was no job protection in Massachusetts on the basis of sexual orientation. You could be fired that day or Monday when you arrived at school. And then over the years, in fact, this, this demonstration, this day did morph into more of a celebration. And that's a wonderful thing, but I think that this year there has been the right mix of protest and celebration, and this is a joyous day. I am so happy that Pride is back. 
Now you don't have to be worried about losing your job so much, and there are people in positions of power that are openly gay at this point, uh, including our governor in this commonwealth. So things have changed. And you know what I'm most excited about? I cannot wait to see the drag performances uh, out here today. I've missed those. I'm not going to the clubs like I used to when I was younger. Uh, and so this is an opportunity that I get, takes me back to my youth, to my young days. Um, and I love uh, seeing the drag performers. And given how um, much hate there's been surrounding drag performances and drag throughout other parts of the country, it's interesting that Northampton continues to celebrate it in this way. Absolutely, and it's always always been, I think, a significant part of uh, Pride Parade, uh, or as long as I have been attending Pride, which is close to 20 years, it's always been a significant part of, of what is celebrated. And I think it's particularly important this year because Northampton was the first Pride Parade statewide, and it really was an institution when it went through the COVID-induced hiatus. And for it to come back with such a, such joy and such fervor and so many people and such energy and just all the wonderful colors and all of the wonderful vibes that are here, not to sound too 1960-ish, but really, what a fabulous day. Also, they're playing Cher. Hey! <laughs> that really does take me back. Now I'm with the Chief of Police of Northampton, Jody Casper. We were just talking with Bill Newman about the very first Pride in 1982 where people were fearful that they would lose their jobs for marching and now you're in a high office in the city of Northampton and openly queer. What does this mean to you as, as a queer person and as an official in the city of Northampton to have this event back? This is one of my favorite events in the city. Uh, Pride has been part of my life, my whole life really, coming here even before I was on the job with the Northampton Police Department. So I love Pride. And I've actually, we were chatting about some stories of early pride here. One of the officers here has been on the department for 30 or 40 years. And he was remembering working the first one where people were throwing rocks at the officers and all the participants. And he was talking about how much has changed. And I mean, this is just a great event now with celebration. It's fantastic. I love it. Is there any worry with all of the politics that's been going on in, from a security standpoint about what's happening today? Yes. Yes, there is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm worried a little bit. Yes. As even a no, here. you know, it's funny because people walk up and they're like, oh, what a great event, and uh, are you enjoying the day? And I, of course, yes, I'm enjoying the day, but um, things have changed in our country, and these sorts of events where you have a lot of like-minded people get together, I always worry about people who think differently coming in and um, doing harm you know, to members of our community. So without a doubt, I think we're all on high alert on, on days like this and on, on many days when we have events in our community. Well, I got fingers crossed that we won't have to worry about it and everything will go smooth. It's been great so far, and we totally lucked out with weather, so it's totally. fantastic. I'd introduce your partner, but I don't want to out her unless she wants to be on. <laughs> she marched today with um, the South Hadley Middle School. Yeah. Oh, do you want to mention what your name is? Yeah. My name's Melissa Lake. <laughs> nice. And is it okay to say it's your partner? Of course, yes, of course. <laughs> That's Chief Jody Casper's partner. Well, you're often working, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's great to meet you. Yeah, you uh, too. What does pride mean to you? Put um, a shirt on that says "Protect Queer Youth." Yeah, you know I'm a school counselor, and it's really important for me for my younger students, especially middle school age. They're right at the time they're figuring things out, and I want them to know that they have a community and they have a space and they are seen for who they are. And I'm so excited to have Pride back. It's the first time since COVID, so I have a group of 10, 11, 12 year olds in here somewhere, and they were blown away by the amount of people who were cheering for them and out to see everybody. So it's a wonderful day. <laughs> Up next, a preview of the East Hampton Film Festival, which kicks off this Friday with festival organizer Chris Ferry and filmmakers Wally Marzano Lesnovich and Melissa Demetris. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Two, three, four, five, six. Welcome back to the Fabulous 413. This Friday through the 26th of May is the return of the East Hampton Film Festival. And joining us are one of the festival organizers, filmmaker and actor Chris Ferry, and two of the filmmakers who will be featured during the festival, Wally Marzano-Lesnovich, who's also an actor, and Melissa Demetrius. We, Khalees and I spent uh, part of this afternoon watching your movie, Melissa, uh, Oh, so, <laughs> recognizing several friends. <laughs> and locations. So it's called Two Eggs Scrambled. Maybe since we're uh, talking about that, I put a little clip in there from Two Eggs Scrambled. So let's hear a little bit of uh, Melissa's movie that will be featured as part of the East Hampton Film Festival. It's too 
scrambled eggs. What? That's what I ordered, yes. No, 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 you said two eggs scrambled. Who, who says that? It's two scrambled eggs. The menu says that. Well, the menu is putting the subject before the adjective, which in this case makes the menu sound like an idiot. How did you end up... A bum? I was gonna say outside in the freezing cold. Same thing. And you? You from around here or what? Me? No. God, no. I'm from about as far away as you can get. That's the appeal. Why'd you come here? To be lonely. That scene takes place in the Miss Florence Diner, which many people from our area know about. And uh, Melissa, if you listen to that clip, you may think it's like Jim Jarmusch's Coffee and Cigarettes or a movie that takes place in a diner like that, but that is not the real crux of, of that movie. Tell us about your movie uh, that'll be featured as part of the East Hampton Film Festival these coming weeks. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I kind of just wrote this script as a rough draft and got some local friends who were filmmakers together and we decided to make this movie for fun and, um, you know, with the intention of becoming a filmmaker, but I have been really excited to see how, um, how well it's been doing. And we got Miss Florence Diner because I'm Greek and the owner's Greek, so that always helps. <laughs> um, but the movie's the about so <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the movie is about this middle-aged woman who's sort of like moved far away from everyone she knows and is alone. And we sort of sort of start out the movie seeing her very isolated and really by choice and. She starts to encounter this person without housing again and again and again, and they notice each other. And um, one night, it's a terrible snowstorm, and she picks him up, and they go to a diner, and they start talking, and then they start meeting every day. Um, and then their relationship kind of evolves from there, and they both learn a lot and grow. That's filmmaker Melissa that Dimitrez, <laughs> uh, who yeah. features uh, parts of Northampton in this uh, movie that we played an excerpt from. And we were both surprised to see our friend. In Trend a locked in. <laughs> plays the server at the oh, Miss Florence it was Diner. amazing. And then I was del delighted to hear the music of M. Ayers, who was on our show last week talking about trans health issues featured as part of the film. Chris Ferry from the East Hampton Film Festival. When might we be able to see uh, this film as part of what you're putting on in East Hampton? The next weekend. Uh -huh. uh, so it's not this first weekend. It's the next weekend. It's part of uh, four. It's a local showcase. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, four films. I believe it's next Saturday. <laughs> I should know my own schedule. <laughs> <laughs> it, it seems like you might have had a lot to organize with this, so you can be forgiven. Yeah, there's a lot. It's all on the website. Yeah, there the website. you go. <laughs> um, but we're going to show Wally's film as well. We got Wally here. And... Um, that evening that uh, Melissa's is showing, three of the four films are local, local, like right here in the area where you're going to recognize performers and soundtrack contributors and everything. Places and yeah. things. Because yeah. in addition to Miss Flows, there was also River Valley Co-op yeah. that you could see in, in the locations. It's really cool to see and recognize your home in other people's movies. I don't know why that is, but it is. It's like a cheap thrill. Every time you're like, hey, I know that person. I know that location. <laughs> it's so actually great. Friday, May 19th at 7 p.m. at that's, East Hampton Media. That's oh, when yours is going to you. be? And that, that is the you. local uh, showcase. Sorry. Yep. So <laughs> that's it. That's correct. Check out the website, East Hampton Film Festival dot com for that's all why I'm here yeah <laughs> and that's Wally Marzano Lesnovich um, I couldn't find a clip from your movie Wally but if our engineer is ready I did find a clip of your uh, of your acting all right so let's hear that and you are so pathetically scared to make a change well then how about I make a change right now you're fired this was my safe space that was Wally going all to, uh, former president of the United States in that clip right there, firing somebody. Very method. Uh, no, that was a... <laughs> oh, no! Exactly. <laughs> that was a clip from a short film I made several years ago called Therapy Bro, 
But uh, the film that we'll be screening this year at the East Hampton Film Festival is called Thunderclap. We shot it on location in Prosperity, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. Uh, I made it with a fellow filmmaker named Ray Smith, and it deals with a woman who's a veteran of the Iraq War and her struggling with PTSD. Mm. Heavy. Indeed. Yes. And do you appear in this film, too? or No, I directed this film mm-hmm. and co-wrote it. Mm-hmm. That's Wally Marzano Lesnovich, who's one of the filmmakers, will be featured at the East Hampton Film Festival, which begins uh, this weekend. Melissa, uh, tell us what got you into filmmaking. Melissa Demetrius, who's a film yeah. we just played the little clip from a second ago there. So I was a screenwriter. Well, I actually started out a fiction writer in New York. And then I wrote this pilot kind of for fun, and a producer came to one of my writing groups because he knew someone in the group and was excited about the pilot. And long story short, I became a screenwriter and moved to Los Angeles. (laughs) And then after like sort of a while in the industry as a screenwriter, um, I sort of like walked back the careers of my heroes like Mark Duplass and sort of realized that everybody that I admired in film had started out making their own work. And I think there's a certain amount of like gatekeeping that happens in the industry. And the way to kind of skirt around that is to make your own film. So I decided to just start doing that. And Two Eggs was supported, supposed to be like a practice film. And, you know, because I had just moved here, I didn't really, I feel like now I might not be so bold to ask like Miss Florence Diner River Valley. <laughs> but at the time I didn't really like, understand how those are sort of hallmarks in our community. So I was just like, hey, can I film something here? Um, <laughs> With the I mean, aforementioned Greek amazing. bravado, right? Yeah. That's true. Yeah, that really helps. The Greeks, <laughs> we look out for each other. But, um, but yeah, and it's, it's actually been really incredible. And the transition from only screenwriting to writing and directing has been, like, amazing. I really love it. And I'm making a second short this year. Excellent. Wally, do you feel yeah. that same shift like between acting and writing, directing? That's a really good question. Um, I've been fortunate enough to make a bunch of shorts as a writer and an actor and uh, two features, one of which is in post solely as a writer, a co-writer this last time. And I feel like they all feed each other. Like you learn a lot about being a writer from acting and vice versa. Um, this was my first time directing. I'm eager to do that. And I should uh, also say that my guild is on strike right now. Yeah, we want to talk about that. Yeah, so shout out to the Writers Guild. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's do it now then. So tell, first, for those who don't understand, what is the Writers Guild of America and how does one become a part of it? Absolutely. So it is a group of professional writers, uh, Writers Guild of America East and the Writers Guild of America West. And there's uh, about roughly 11,000 current members. And, um, you know, I can only speak for myself. I became a part of it through this uh, last feature that I co-wrote that's in post-production. I co-wrote it with the actor-comedian Paul Reiser, and he stars in it opposite the Irish actor Colm Meany. I just started watching Deep Space Nine, so I'm ah. all excited about that at the request of Khalees Smith. Oh. Deep Space Nine is from the an, best from Star the news Trek. But that's an, that's an aside. <laughs> he is uh, wonderful in that and a tremendous actor and a, a really great guy on set. That's great. Yeah. Um, and were you required because you're working uh, maybe at a different level with these? Paul Reiser is a very well-established actor. That you, do you, Must you become part of the union to be working with actors in their own unions? Um, well, in this case, in the writer's union, yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So uh, because, in a way, this feature was a sort of leveling up for me um, to get to work with Paul and to get to work with the production companies, uh, Nuance Productions and Max Films. It was shot on location in Ireland this past year. I was required to join the Guild, and it was a real honor, you know. So tell us your take on what's going on with the strike. I've heard, you know, tell signs where people are going to and accept an award for, say, being a writer on the Hulu show The Bear with zero money in their bank accounts and then having to go out and get a job after accepting a writing award. Is Does that feel true to your experience with this, even though you've only been in the union for a short time? It feels true to my bank account, definitely. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think... Welcome to the arts, everybody. Exactly. Um, I I think we live in a time where everybody binges so much television and streams so many movies and uh, films are, are doing really well in theaters. And the writers, the artists, the people who make this for the, the corporate cor- corporations are being squeezed out and aren't seeing 
their fair share. And if you go back and look at the history of the Writers Guild, every time that they've been able to win a concession, whether it's a better health uh, health coverage or residuals, has been through a strike. And it's a shame that it had to come to this, but it did have to come to this. And the Writers Guild negotiated on really good faith to give the streamers and the studios the opportunities to not let it come to this, but here we are. Now, are either you, Melissa, or you, Chris, part of the same Writers Guild, or are you uh, free to cross that picket line, I guess, as it were? Which you wouldn't do. Which you wouldn't do. <laughs> yeah, I would not do that. I am not. I yeah. am not. I am not in the Writers Guild, but I've been following the strike pretty closely. Um, one of my writing coaches in L.A. let me know it was going to happen like months ago, so I was kind of looking into why, because we all remember the one in 2007. And, and during that one, Melissa, I was not in the Writers Guild either, but I was living in L.A. picketing, because eventually the yeah. pre-Guild writers are going to be in the Guild. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you think will come out of this particular show? What, and it's streaming is really the problem here at this point, right? Where it's just the, the model is different. There may be fewer episodes and you're getting paid per episode. Is that sort of why where the economic breakdown happens here as opposed to... Um, lack of guarantee for like continued services. Well, like you don't know if you're... Like, and it's a little bit different like finding out when your series is going to get continued, right? Absolutely. I mean, there's a difference between features and television. But it's everything from the fact that the streaming residuals have dropped off to the idea that has been floated that studios or streamers want to use AI content to write drafts of stories. And that's just, I mean, does anybody want to watch that? Not really. Do you yeah. think that the pandemic has anything, was a good like catalyst for this where everybody was streaming constantly because we didn't have any other outlet for said entertainment? I think so, without a doubt. And it's nice to see movie theaters rebounding on some level. And uh, just to bring it back to Chris, it's nice to see people like him creating a space where local filmmakers can show smaller works because that's the way that we grow and, and get to the places where we can join a, a guild or a union. And Melissa's short that we watched today is about 18 minutes long. It's great and will be showcased as part of the East Hampton Film Festival. How long is your thunderclap? Uh, uh, it's wide? about... 17 minutes yeah, yeah that's i mean but that's Perfect. it's yeah. it's amazing and i love it i mean people get all caught up in you know guardians of the galaxy volume three two and a half hours long but these little um short films are seemingly as a creator man much more manageable to create and still wonderful absolutely i think that they're a, a great jumping off point and melissa you can speak to this in terms of moving to the next project so melissa will this will your next project also be a short or um are you hoping to expand a little bit more yeah, so, I, so I'm a comedy writer, and that's why I keep saying, like, this was supposed to sort of just be a fun little project, and now this <laughs> drama, like, ended up in these festivals. But what's been really great about it is because that was my first film that I made, um, now I have something to send potential crew members other than just a script. You know, I can say, like, this is what I can do. And so in June, I'm shooting a comedy short, and then later this year, we're shooting a proof of concept with the hope that that will go to festivals and get funding to make a feature um, in the next year or two. And I want to do it all in Western Mass, so that's any great. actors. Well, coming up, we'll Come talk a little bit about <laughs> what brought you all to Western Mass, and we'll talk more with the uh, curator of the East Hampton Film Festival, one of the organizers, Chris Ferry. I have a clip from you, too, so don't think I, I left you out, Chris. That's, that's uh, bad news. As well as <laughs> actors. <Says> who? <laughs> Wally marzano Lesnovich. And Melissa Dimitrez, you're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. My name's Joel. All my day, I have That's the music of M. Ayers, who just happened to be on our show last week talking about trans health, but who provides the music for Melissa Dimitrez's movie, Two Eggs Scrambled, which will be screened as part of the East Hampton Film Festival. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. We're talking to one of the festival organizers, Chris Ferry, uh, Ferry, as well as Melissa Dimitres and Wally Marzano Lesnovich. Now, I played clips from from Wally and from Melissa, Chris, and you. I know you're producing a horror movie right now. Is that true? That is true. Tell first before that we play. Like so much fun. I know. Tell us about your horror movie before we play your clip. So, um, my buddy Travis from graduate school came up for last year's festival, and we were in East Works at one point, and he was like, "Wow, these old mill buildings are amazing." <laughs> I'm really into uh, back rooms and liminal spaces. Have you ever heard of this? And I was like, well, I don't know what you're talking about. So he, we went down this internet hole together of 
this whole thing in horror now, which is these kind of behind the scenes, in between, getting lost in the, where am I? And he wrote a film that is, you know, it's about a young woman who kind of gets lost in these liminal spaces. And so we got to shoot in Eastworks and Keystone and all of these great, we are still shooting. <laughs> they, so, well, like, so you're shooting now, which is a shame because Eastworks used to have this room in their crazy, like, whereas now they're like convention space that was just called the hot room. And <laughs> like, that's what it said on the door. And it looked like a vault and we were all afraid. <laughs> So it's scary enough as it is. It would there, have been perfect. <laughs> there, there are other rooms, trust me. And oh, we've yes. got them on film. So uh, it's going to be really cool when that comes out. And it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> so, Chris Ferry, I found your clip on IMDb with your with your website. So okay. let's hear your, okay. your acting debut here. Hey, it's Mega Monkey. I love this game. Oh, look at there. My God, level seven, you're doing great. Man, you're good at this. You know, this part always killed me. You ever played this yet? You this board? You're coming up on the big, the Uber monkey. He's got a rocket launcher. You ever see? Okay. You want to know what he comes up? He pops out of nowhere. He's got like an invisibility, a cloaking device. You can never see him. So be on your toes. And what you got to do is you got to jump over the rocket when he shoots it. Because it, it, okay, just don't worry about it. You're kind of. Where is that? I don't know. See that flicker? I think that may be him over here. Oh, no. Get these guys. Wait, get these guys. Hand. Okay. Uh, get these guys first. No, that's him. Here he comes. Shoot him. Jump. Jump. Well, you get him next time. So you're doing what I do to my children, which is play a video game over someone's shoulder. I happen to do this mostly to my son Enzo, and you have a movie about Enzo's wedding coming up there. There we Walt. go. That's right. But uh, but Chris, tell us about that clip that we just heard. Uh, that was from a movie called The Fittest. That was the first uh, film I was ever in, and uh, I com that was completely improvised. That scene. <laughs> uh, it's nice a pretty great scene. It was yeah. really fun. Yeah, we were I making up all of the things that the creatures were supposed to be doing on the video game. Yeah, we just winged it, and and that, that was the director who was playing the game. And uh -huh. afterwards, he's like, "Do we get it?" And they go, "I think that's the one. We did, we only did one <laughs> take of that. See, that's the scene. Oh, that's nice. pretty great. Yeah. So we're East Hampton now. Is this a bustling filmmaking hub? Chris, what brought you to East Hampton and made you want to put on a festival like this here in Western Mass? Yeah, I mean, I was one of the people that fled New York uh, during COVID, and we moved up here because my best friend Jay Johnson uh, lives up here, and I'd been to visit many times and loved it. And I thought, you know, I need to build a community for myself. I'll get involved in the local film festival because that's what I'm into, and I couldn't find one. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it might have been Jay. He was like, well, why don't you start one? And I was like, well, I don't. I start one. <laughs> <laughs> and I started one. So last year you had it on just the one weekend, but this year it's basically three weekends. What are you able to show or or teach this year with more time and expanded resources? So there's a couple key things that are different this year. One, we're doing workshops, and Wally is leading one of those workshops that culminates on Tuesday. So I definitely I want to talk about that, but not just yet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is, uh, I do talkbacks with the attending filmmakers afterwards, and that's my favorite part of it. Um, but it's also exhausting because I get really excited, and at the <laughs> end of it, I just feel completely drained. Uh, and so I thought, well, I can't do seven in one weekend. I just cannot do it. So I'm going to spread it out. Hopefully people who can't come to one might be able to come to another. And I think that with the workshops and the sort of more protracted schedule, I hope we're going to get some more engagement. We had good engagement last year, but I want to get even more this year. So, Wally, tell us about the workshop that you'll be leading. Yeah, it's been a great experience. Um, it culminates in a staged reading tomorrow night. It's uh, been a short film screenwriting workshop, and we've really gone from the first germ of an idea all the way to these finished scripts uh, with these um, emerging screenwriters, and we're going to be doing a, uh, a reading with actors for them tomorrow night. And uh, I really have to thank Chris for, for bringing me on board this. And uh, my hope is that uh, I can help them produce it and stay involved with them and that each of them will have the opportunity to not just be emerging screenwriters, but now be directors and producers. Now, I asked Chris what brought him to Western Mass. You're from living here now, too? Uh, yes, we've been here about two years. Mm -hmm. um, I grew up outside of New York and New Jersey. And uh, the short answer is my wife. Mm -hmm. uh, That's why I'm here, too. Exactly. Uh, Your wife. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, boy. Oh, no. We uh, are only 
a few weeks into this. <laughs> it was going so well. Shout out to my wife, uh, Lindsay Atkins, who took a job um, working at Mount Holyoke College. Her family is from the area. And shout out to my in-laws, uh, Wayne and Sue, who help with our daughter. So uh, we were delighted to come and delighted to find a independent filmmaking community, mm -hmm. which is amazing. Because it's bigger than you might think in the area. And Without a really, doubt. It's really great. Um, and Melissa, the same question for you. You were talking about how you were in L.A. and then you came here. And if you want to divulge what else that you do creatively in the in the area, feel free. But tell us why you're here in Western oh. Mass. <laughs> well, I am the also the events director at the Northampton Center for the Arts, which is how I think we met a couple times. Which is where we're going to be going a little bit later to uh, talk with Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra. Yes. So that'll be fun. Oh, awesome. We love them. Yeah, so do we. Um, how did I end up in the area? Well, after L.A., I decided I wanted to be back in New York. So I got an apartment in New York, and then it fell through, and my best friend, was, who's from Amherst, had moved back and was like, come stay with me while you figure out what you're going to do. And I went and stayed with her, and then we started making movies, and then a pandemic hit, <laughs> and here we are. <laughs> and somewhere in there, I met my husband. So, <laughs> kind of the same answer, too. Life lesson for people um, listening. You may make that route to New York or to L.A., but you're always coming back here. There we go. <laughs> Usually it'll be your spouse, That's apparently. <laughs> I mean, I had been in New York for a decade, and I really didn't think anything would ever separate us. And then turns out the pandemic could separate us. <laughs> the East Hampton Film Festival <laughs> begins this Friday. It goes all the way through May 26th. Things happening all three weekends. Uh, you can find out the whole list of what's going on, where and when, at East Hampton filmfestival.com, but I'm going to ask in the two minutes we have left, if you know, think about it. Chris gets, has to go first because he knows all the films theoretically. Something you're particularly excited to see at the film festival this year? I, I say this genuinely. All of it is great. It's all great. There is a film from a 17-year-old filmmaker that I came across last minute that is one of the best pieces of short filmmaking I've ever seen in wow. my life. And are they from here or where are they from? No, they're from, you know. Oh, well. Yeah. Red, mid, mid They'll be mid here on, well, yeah. or their film will be here. He, as part of unfortunately, it. is not going to be able to make it himself. But that is a gem. It's part of the 7 at 7. Melissa, what are you excited to see at the film festival this year? Well, I was lucky enough to see one of the short comedies um, called Anaconda, before the festival and it's some filmmakers out in LA already sold and they yep. it, they're, it's hilarious it's really really great and I actually spoke with the filmmaker today just so impressive and it's really funny and feminist and unexpected and it's so good um, and then I'm also going to plug that on May 26th Chris you might have already been planning to plug this um, at I think six o'clock we're going to do a networking event for local filmmakers so it would be great if People around the thinking about it, you can come out and for everybody. Yeah, yeah. it's not just filmmakers, yeah. but it's a great like I met these two because of the festival last year, and the fact that these two local filmmakers didn't know each other is flabbergasting to me. Like you two absolutely need to know that you're both doing what you do, <laughs> and now you do. Now you do. And that's what's great about the East Hampton Film Festival. Before we all uh, have to end, Wally, Wally what favorite? are you excited to see? Yeah, I'm very excited. Next Saturday at 11 is a block for families, so I'm going to take my two and a half, our two and a half year old daughter and introduce her to independent film, not non-frozen. You've been, non -frozen you've been film. promised that frozen, frozen will not films? be part yeah. of it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to start them young. Exactly. Expand it's their horizons. Popcorn well, and indies. Thank you all so much for coming. Filmmakers Melissa Dimitris, Wally marzano Lesnovich, and Chris Ferry, all part of the East Hampton Film Festival, which begins this Friday and goes through May 26th. Yep. Excited to check some of it out. Tomorrow in the Fabulous 413, we will finally have a happy cow story. We talk with Angie Fassi, a dairy farmer from Leiden, Leiden, sorry, who is the general manager of Our Family Farms Milk. And we'll talk with conductor Kaylin Marcel Manson and first chair violin Michi Wianco of the Northeast Repertory Orchestra, Nero, who are working on burning down all the racial and societal barriers surrounding symphonic music. They're playing The Shade this weekend. Our director is Tony in Meeting Hell Done. Our engineer is Betsy, Underground Radio Ninja Cordis. Our technical team is Bart Enko and Hospice Rank and Kara cleaning out Main Street Foster and Punk Rock, rock Dubay. Musical thanks to Spouse, Happy Valley Guitar Orchestra, Homebody, M. Ayers, Kylie Minogue, Cher. Yeah, and that's about it. I'm Monty <laughs> Belmonte. Kelly Smith, we'll see you tomorrow in the 413. <laughs>